Hi everyone, welcome back. I hope you're all doing well and I hope you've all recovered from last week's very, very intense case. Last week's case was a lot. It was, it was too much. And today we are going to be covering another completely unbelievable, horrifying story. And that is the case of Alison Botha. Alison was a young woman. She was living in South Africa and she was just living her best life. She was living the life of any 20 something year old. But then late one evening, something happened that is literally everyone's worst nightmare. A stranger approached her car and she was abducted. And following this, the ordeal that Alison had to go through is so, so unbelievable. Today's case is another one of those cases is where it's just so unbelievable. I had to keep reminding myself, how is this real? And at the center of this case are two completely evil, despicable men, Franz de Toy and Tians Kruger. And these two, as always, they are the worst. I don't even want to call them human. And there has actually been an update on this case to do with Franz and Tians that only happened this year. And this update makes my blood boil. And the fact that there has been an update in this case only this year is why I wanted to cover this case now. And yeah, you'll have to stick around for the end to see the update because it's shocking. But before we get onto today's case, I just wanna give a huge thank you to today's sponsor and that is ExpressVPN. So I am a pretty private person and I'm sure most of you have probably figured that out by now. But when I'm using the internet, I just hate the thought of someone tracking what I am doing. I hate the thought that someone could be spying on what I'm doing. Not not that I'm doing anything suspicious. I mean, my Google history is a bit questionable, but I'm not doing anything suspicious, but I just don't want anyone watching me. I take my privacy seriously. And with ExpressVPN, I never have to worry about that because ExpressVPN makes it a lot more difficult for advertisers and big tech companies to track what you are doing. ExpressVPN sends all of your traffic through an encrypted tunnel so no one can see what you're doing. ExpressVPN masks your device's IP address, making it much much more difficult for people to track you online. It even protects you from hackers when you're using unsecured Wi-Fi, for example, at a coffee shop. So whenever I'm out connected to Wi-Fi, I just know that I'm so much more secure because I'm using ExpressVPN. And ExpressVPN is so easy to install and use. It works across all devices and I literally just have it on, running all the time in the background. And it's just a huge peace of mind that it's just there, it's working, it's protecting me. But not only that, ExpressVPN has another amazing benefit because it lets you change your online location so you can unlock content from all over the world. I use it to watch Netflix for shows and movies that are not available in the UK. I also use it for YouTube for videos that are not available in my country. I know that a lot of you guys use it as well to access BBC iPlayer, which I 100% recommend because there are so many good programs on there. Also amazing for my research, for true crime documentaries, and it comes in handy for literally everything. So I am a huge tennis fan. Me and my husband, we always watch the Grand Sams and it's currently the US Open right now. However, the coverage in the UK is, is not the best and I can't watch most of the replays. And given the fact that it's the US Open and I'm in the UK, I need to watch the replays because of the time difference. And I was getting really frustrated because I love watching the Grand Slams and I was thinking, how the hell am I supposed to watch it? But I found a service in Australia that is incredible. So I changed my location on ExpressVPN to Australia, signed up to a service that shows all of the US Open matches, the replays, the highlights, the press conferences. And because it's Australian, there is English commentary as well, which is just an added bonus. And I can watch any match that I want, which is absolutely incredible. And it truly, truly made my week. I cannot tell you how many times ExpressVPN has literally saved the day. And if you guys wanted to try out ExpressVPN for yourselves, then you can get three months of ExpressVPN for free right now by going to expressvpn.com forward slash Danielle, or by going to the link in my description box. And using that link in my description box really does help out this channel. So I just want to give a huge thank you to ExpressVPN for sponsoring today's video, but thank you to every single one of you guys watching right now, because truly without all of you guys, I wouldn't get opportunities like this. And now let's jump into today's case. Okay, so we're going to start with the two evil perpetrators and we're going to start with the main one because there's always a main one. There's always a leader. And today that is a man called Franz de Toy. So Franz de Toy was born on the 6th of July, 1968, making him a cancer. And he grew up in the town 
of Alawal North in South Africa. Yes, we are in South Africa again today. We haven't been to South Africa in a very, very long time. And I always get requests to do South African cases. And Franz was the son of a policeman, which definitely does play a little bit of a role. He also grew up in a very strict religious Christian household. He went to church every week. And there isn't really much to note in his young childhood. However, when he gets to a teenager, Franz completely goes off the rails. It is said that when he went to high school, he just fell in with the wrong crowd and his friends were just no good. He started dabbling in drugs by the age of 13. He actually set his school on fire, which it's like, that's not normal teenage rebellion, okay? No, but you'll never guess what he blamed it on. He blamed the fact that he was listening to heavy metal music. He said that that was the reason why he burnt down his school. So he got expelled from school. Shocker. And his parents relocated to Port Elizabeth on the south coast of South Africa. And then it was whilst he was in this new city that Franz started to dabble a little bit in Satanism. And when I refer to Satanism in this case, I really do mean worshipping the devil. Like I actually do mean that in today's case. So apparently he met a girl who was the head witch of a coven. And this coven was, was no friend friendly coven, let's just say that. They dabbled in the dark arts and she said that she possessed supernatural powers and that you shouldn't cross her because she could wish bad fortune on somebody and it would come true. And the two of them started dating and she started to teach Franz all like these spells and dark magic. And they would conduct satanic rituals where demons would manifest. And Franz has actually said that he was possessed by the devil at least twice. And I just want to point out that he's like 14, 15 max at this point. And yeah, this is what he is doing. So whilst all of this is going on and Franz is dabbling with dark magic and he's getting involved with the wrong people, his grades at school dropped dramatically. He failed two grades completely. And in the end, he actually just dropped out of school altogether and his parents were so concerned about him and they blamed this girl that he was dating, the witch, like they blamed everything on her. So they forced Franz to stop seeing her. Following this, at some point when Franz is around 18, Franz joined the army. He spent a couple of years in the army, but he spent most of his time in the detention barracks because he literally just could not control his behavior. So after leaving the army at age 20, Franz got a job as a minor. He met a girl very quickly and they got married and they had a daughter together. But literally after a few months after his daughter was born, Franz just got up and left his wife, got up and left his daughter because apparently his wife quote, didn't satisfy him sexually. And I don't think he ever saw his daughter again, which I've got to say he's probably better off for the daughter. And then following this, Franz just kind of like moves around a bit, a little bit of a transient lifestyle. He moved to a different town and he got a job as a delivery driver, which he was fired from pretty much straight away because he was caught stealing from his employer. Following this, Franz wanted to try and make easy money. So he started selling alcohol illegally. And then in 1993, Franz got married again again had another child very quickly. This time he had a son and Franz is still following his devil worshipping like satanic rituals and beliefs and all stuff like that. So when his wife was pregnant, Franz performed a ritual to the devil asking for his son to be born on his birthday. So July the 6th. He wanted to share the same birthday with his son. Now, I don't know why. Is there something significant about the 6th of July? I, I don't know. Maybe he just wanted the same birthday as his son. But what is so, so strange is that his son was born on his birthday. It's like, how the hell did that happen? Was it just a weird coincidence? Or what is possibly more likely is that Franz is lying about the birthday of his son. But either way, after this 
happened, Franz was convinced that he had supernatural abilities. He would go around telling everyone that he had the power of Satan. So that is pretty much a pretty brief summary of Franz and his background and his upbringing. And all in all, he's a waste of space, isn't he? He's married two women. He's walked out on one, completely abandoned his daughter. He can't hold a job down. He's lazy. And he turned to petty crime to earn money. And something that I haven't mentioned yet, which is very important, is that he would constantly rely on his parents. He would always go to his parents to give him money. Like literally, he is a grown ass adult and he's too lazy to hold down a job. So he constantly goes back to his parents asking for money. But not just that. Remember, his dad is a policeman and his dad would bail him out of everything. Like every time he got arrested, his dad would definitely uh, do some stuff to get his son off. So all in all, Franz has never really had to grow up. He's never had any responsibility and his parents just bail him out of everything. So at the age of 25, this is when Franz meets another equally despicable human being. And this is 19 year old Tians Kruger. And let's just say that they would be a match made in hell. So Tians Kruger was born in 1975. An exact date of birth is not known. And he grew up in Port Elizabeth, South Africa, and he had a very troubled upbringing. Pretty much the complete opposite of Franz, because Franz in the grand scheme of things, I had a pretty comfortable upbringing while Tians did not have that at all. Because Tians, his biological dad, he was a criminal and a drug addict and he disappeared pretty much as soon as his mom fell pregnant. So I don't actually know if Tians even knew his biological dad. And then when Tians' mom was still pregnant with him, his mom got married to another man. However, she soon got divorced from this other man when she had literally only just given birth to Tians. And then when Tians was only nine months old, his mom got married to another person. So this third man, it was not good news. No, he was a terrible human being. He would abuse Tians. He would beat Tians black and blue. It is also rumored that he was sexually assaulting Tians as well. And this was going on throughout the whole of Tians' childhood. So he was being physically and sexually abused by his stepdad. Tians was also relentlessly bullied in school because he had a third nipple, which he would later on get removed. And Tians, he had a very, very, very hard childhood childhood, there was actually a number of times where he contemplated taking his own life. He also ran away multiple times. He just felt like he never fit in. And at the age of 15, he dropped out of school altogether. He turned to drugs and alcohol to cope. And then it wasn't long until he also joined the army. And then after spending a little bit of time in the army where Tian's quote, blew a few people's head off. So yeah, take with that what you will. He doesn't really seem like the best person to be in the army because he seems way too angry and volatile. He dropped out of the army. He was only 18 years old. So I don't even know when he joined the army. I'm not sure. And this is when he would go on to have what he has described as a very intense sexual relationship with a satanic witch. Yeah, we have another witch in this case. And this woman apparently introduced Tians to quote the dark side. They would perform satanic rituals together. They would worship the devil together. And then it wasn't long until this woman just left him. And then it was at the age of 19 that Tians met his partner in crime, which was Franz. This was in June of 1994 that they first met and they quickly hit it off. They bonded over the fact that they were both in the army, that they both dropped out of school. They had both dated satanic witches and that they worshiped the devil. And they started to talk about their experiences and their passion for Satanism. And this is when Franz started to tell Tians that he had been possessed by the devil twice. And Tians believed this and he was in awe. He was like, oh my God, no way. And he also believed him when Franz told him that he possessed the power of the devil. And Franz definitely became the more dominating character of the two. I mean, Franz is older. Franz is currently 26 years old and Tians is only 19. So that is quite a big age difference really when you think about it. A 19 year old and a 26 year old. I know there is only seven years there, but there is a lot of growing up in those years. Franz was much more manipulative. He took Tians under his wing. And I don't want to make excuses for Tians at all, but Tians was definitely a lot more naive. 
and a lot more impressionable. And Tien's was also incredibly lonely given all of the trauma that he had gone through in his childhood. He really did look up to Franz and he saw Franz as almost like an older brother, kind of fatherly figure. And he would soon start doing everything that Franz told him to. The two of them started taking midnight trips to the graveyard. They would talk about the power of demons. Franz would also say that because he was possessed by the devil at the age of 15, he possessed the power to move things with his mind, which was never proven that he had that power, by the way. He never actually demonstrated that he had it. And also another power that he possessed was that he was, quote, highly attractive to women. Really? Really? But not just that, this demon that possessed him also gave Franz an insatiable appetite for sex. So he needed sex pretty much 24 seven. He wanted sex all the time and he deserved sex all the time. And because he was powerful, because he was possessed by this devil and that he had the powers of a demon and all stuff like that, he thought that, well, why can't I just take sex whenever I want it? I'm this all powerful being. And Tian's being his little lap dog, agreed with all of this and was like, yeah, well, you deserve sex all of the time. Let's go do it. And I really wish that this was all talk. I really do. But it was literally just months between the two of them meeting before they went on an absolutely horrific sexual assault spree. At some point in 1994, Franz would sexually assault a woman for the first time that we know of. Because I just want to stress, given Franz and his personality, it is highly likely that this was not the first time that he ever sexually assaulted a woman. But Franz would sexually assault this woman on his own. Tien's was not there for this one. Because one evening, a 20-year-old student who was just in her car sitting outside of a pizza parlor in Port Elizabeth, and this is when Franz approached the car with a gun. He forced his way inside the car and drove to a secluded area where he proceeded to rape this woman. And after this absolutely horrific sexual assault, this young woman was in hysterics. But then Franz did something so sick, and I really do think that this is so sick. He then drove her to a cafe where he bought her dinner and he gave her a single rose. I'm sorry, that just makes this so sick. He took her on a date. He forced this young woman to eat dinner with him. It's so sick and twisted. And I really think that this actually does portray Franz's personality perfectly. And you will see this. This is where Franz and Tians, they do contrast. Because Franz, he does seem to think that he's like this charming ladies man. That he is very seductive. That he is irresistible to women. And women will just fall at his feet and do whatever he wants. I think he truly thinks that he's a good person like I do. And it's just so sick and twisted. So then after he forced this woman to go on this date with him, he then drove her to another secluded area where he raped her again. But during this rape, Franz forced the woman to say that she loved him during the rape. And then after this second assault, he dropped her off in the city and he said to her, quote, you're an amazing person. I hope that I can make this up to you sometime. And then he drove off in her car. And this is what I mean. He truly thinks that he's a good person, that what he is doing is not bad. It's not bad at all. Because, you know, he's Franz. He's irresistible to women. He's highly attractive to women. So surely a woman won't mind being sexually assaulted by him. That is how his mind works. And then after this, the woman did go to the police, even though Franz told her not to. Franz was arrested. However, he was soon released least because there was no medical evidence that this woman had been raped. It was just her word against his. And I wouldn't be surprised if Franz got his daddy involved. Mm -hmm. Yeah, daddy the police officer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure if that happened, but I wouldn't be surprised if it did. So then a few more months pass and we get to the 4th of December 1994. This time Franz and Tians decide to go on to rape a woman together. So on this evening they came across a 20 21 year old woman who was three months pregnant and she was walking alone in an isolated part of town. And this is when Franz went up to her and pushed a gun into her stomach. He forced her into a secluded area that had bushes all around it. Tians was then the one to rape her first. And then following
following this, Franz forced the woman to perform oral sex on him. However, the woman started to gag and Franz got really angry at this and then he proceeded to rape her instead. And throughout this whole assault, the woman was pleading with both Franz and Tien's because she was pregnant and they were being very rough with her. And she was so scared that they were going to hurt her baby and she was pleading with them to stop. And then after they both had finished sexually assaulting this poor woman, they actually stood there and debated whether to kill this woman. But finally, they decided against it. Great people, aren't they? I can't believe they were just debating in front of her whether to kill her or not. And they let this woman go. But again, this woman went straight to the police and both Franz and Tians were both arrested. But was anything actually done about this? Not really. After Franz and Tians were both interviewed about this assault, they were both released pending a further court appearance on January the 5th, which is so frustrating that they were both just released when they should have been kept in jail awaiting that court appearance because they have both been arrested before, especially Franz. He has already been arrested for a sexual assault. And it's just so frustrating because before that court date would happen, Franz and Tians would go on and commit an absolute horrific, sadistic sexual assault. And this would go down as one of the most horrifying and violent, infamous sexual assaults in South Africa. And it's so frustrating because they should never have been walking the street to commit this. And the woman at the center of this absolutely horrific attack was a woman called Alison Botha. So Alison was currently 27 years old. She was born on the 22nd of September. 1967 and she spent most of her childhood living with her mom and her brother after her parents got divorced when she was 10. But even though her parents divorced, this never really affected Alison. She had a really happy childhood and her mom was amazing at raising her. She would tell both of her children just how special they were, that they could do whatever they wanted. She raised them to have respect and decency. She didn't care if her children went out to get a job or if they went to university or if they went to travel. All she cared about is that they were happy and that they were good people. And because of the way she was raised, Addison had an incredible sense of self-worth. She had so much confidence, but she wasn't cocky. She was so friendly and outgoing and adventurous. She was always willing to help others out. She was head girl at her school and everyone just loved Addison. And after finishing school, Addison studied for a secretarial degree. And then after, she spent some time traveling. And then after four years of traveling, she settled down in Port Elizabeth, South Africa, and she got a job as an insurance broker. And this is when Alison is now age 27 and she's living her best life. She's always going out, she's always socializing, she loves her job. However, this would be when Alison had the unfortunate experience of meeting Franz de Toy and Tians Kruger, and her whole world would be changed forever. So now we get to the 18th of December 1994. And when you think about it, this is literally just 14 days after the last rape. This is what I mean. These two should not even be walking the streets. And it was on the 18th of December that the horrific events of today's case take place. So on this day, Alison had spent the whole day with friends at the beach. It was December, so it was the height of summer. It was a really nice day. Alison had had the best time with her friends. And then later on, on that evening, Alison and all of her friends went back to Alison's apartment to carry on the day. They ordered a pizza. They were just having a really good time. And it was around 1 a.m. that Alison's friends started leaving. But Alison, she didn't want one of her friends to walk home. So Alison dropped her friend home in her car. And then when Alison returned from dropping one of her friends home, she went to park in her usual parking space outside of her apartment building. But someone had taken the space, which she was a little bit annoyed at because that was her space and she was going to have to park further down the street, which was a little bit dark, a little bit more secluded. Alison goes to park further down the street. It's a lot darker. It's a lot more secluded. She turns the engine off, headlights go out, and all of a sudden, someone opens her driver's side door and stood there was this scrawny man holding a knife. And of course, Alison was absolutely terrified. She was probably petrified and frozen in fear. And the man said to her, 
move over or I'll kill you. And of course, it was Franz de Troy. And Alison immediately does what she's told because he's holding a knife. She hasn't got a clue what he's capable of. And Franz climbs into the car and drives off. Now, Franz kept repeatedly saying to Alison, don't worry, I'm not going to hurt you. I just need your car for about an hour. I just need to run some errands. And Alison was really hoping that this was true. And Franz was driving quite fast. And Alison did contemplate plate? Should she jump out of the car? Should she risk it? Should she open the door and just jump? And you never know how you're going to react in a situation like that. But in the moment, Alison was really hoping that Franz was telling the truth, that he wasn't going to hurt her. And there was just so much going on. She didn't really know what to do. So she just sat there. She was just frozen in fear. And Franz asked Alison what her name was. And Alison immediately lied. And she was like, oh, it, it's Susan. And then Alison asked, Franz what his name was. And Franz also lied and said that his name was Clinton. And Franz just started to have like casual conversation with Alison. Franz was asking Alison, does she live in her apartment alone? And Alison, very quick on her feet, said, no, I live with my boyfriend. He's actually there right now expecting me. But this didn't seem to phase Franz that much because that was a really good idea on Alison's part to make Franz think that there was someone waiting for her to report her missing if she didn't come home. Alison was really hoping to scare Franz off. Alison, again, thinking quick on her feet, said to Franz, hey, why don't you just let me out here? You can have the car and everyone wins. And Franz was like, no, no, I want the company. And then Franz says to Alison, I just need to go and find my friend. I want to find him and you're coming with me. So they drive around for a little bit until eventually they stop outside of a nightclub. And there was a lot of people around. It was outside of a nightclub. And Alison was looking at all of these people out on the street, but none of them looked her direction. She was really hoping that someone would look at her and see that she was in distress, that she was in need of help, but no one looked her way. And of course, the friend that Franz wanted to pick up was Tians Kruger. Tians makes his way over to the car and he climbs into the back of the car and Alison got a glimpse of him in the rear view mirror and what she saw sent a shiver down her spine because Tians had this real cold, dead stare. And in that moment, Alison knew that this was not going to end well for her. So Franz drove off with the three of them in the car and Franz drove to the outskirts of Port Elizabeth and he drove until there were no more cars left on the road. There was nobody around. And then he eventually pulled off the main road into a small secluded area, which was kind of like a sandy dirt road. Tians stepped out of the car for a cigarette and now it was just Franz and Alison in that car and it was just dead silent. And Alison turned to Franz and said, what now? And Franz turned to her and so chillingly said, well, I thought you would have realized that we're here to have sex. And Alison was just like, oh no, 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 please, no. How was she going to get out of this? How was she going to get through this? What was she going to do? And Franz just said to her, like, so calmly, are you going to fight? And Alison started weighing up the options in her head. And she realized that there was no way that she could fight. There was two of them, one of her. Franz had a knife. They could have other weapons. So she simply replied, no. Franz ordered Alison to take her clothes off, which she did. And before Alison could even think about what the hell was going on, Franz grabbed her head and forced her head to his crotch. And he said, if you bite me, I'll kill you. And then he forced Alison to perform oral sex on him. Alison tried to resist, but Franz violently forced her to do this, causing Alison to gag. Franz then pulled Alison's head away from him and then he forcibly performed oral sex on her. And he was being so disgusting throughout all of this. He was saying really horrible things to her, like, does your boyfriend do this to you? Are you enjoying this? You have the nicest tasting fat. Fanny. Oh my God. He is just such a sick and perverted individual. And following this, Franz then raped Alison in the back of the car. And Tians is just outside of the car and he is watching this whole thing through the window. And the whole time that this was happening to Alison, Alison was almost trying to distance herself from what was happening. And she kept thinking to herself over and over again, Alison, he is doing this to your body 
but not to you. He cannot touch your mind. He can't touch you. And she kept saying that to herself over and over again. And then once Franz was finished, he got out of the car. And he said to Tians, do you want to have sex with this lovely lady? And this is what I mean when I said about Franz, that he really does think that he is God's gift to women. He really does think that he's so charming and charismatic and that women will just fall at his feet. Like just the language that he uses, like, oh, this lovely lady, as if he's respectful. But anyway, Tians then said, no, I don't. I want to fuck this fucking bitch. And then Franz just mockingly said, don't talk to her like that. She's a lady. Oh God. These two, they are just the worst and they make me so angry. So then Tians climbed into the car and now he raped Alison and he was a lot more forceful. He was a lot more violent. And then once Tians was done, he got out of the car and then the two of them started to have a discussion on whether they should murder Alison or not. However, when they were having this discussion, they started using each other's real names. Because remember, Franz had told Alison that his name was Clinton. And I don't even know if Alison had a clue what Tian's name was. But anyway, when they were having this discussion, they were using each other's real names. So Alison made a mental note. She was like, okay, their real names are Franz and Tian's. I need to remember that. So as they were having this discussion on whether to murder Alison or not, they thought back to the times where they have raped women before and the women have gone to the police and they have been arrested. So they come to the conclusion that they have no option but to murder Alison. And before Alison even had a chance to process that, oh my God, they have literally just decided to kill me. She was out of the car and Franz was on top of her and he had his fingers around her throat and he started to strangle Alison as hard as he could. Alison was trying to fight back. She managed to say, please don't kill me, please don't kill me. But she could barely get the words out because Franz was cutting off her air supply. And then two things happen at pretty much the exact same time. First, Alison empties her bowels and she said that she didn't know how that happened. She didn't mean to. It was just an involuntary response response of her body. But this is actually really significant. So remember this. And then the second thing that happens is that Franz is strangling Alison so hard that he actually crushes her windpipe, completely cutting off her air supply. So now Alison cannot breathe. And sadly, Alison just completely blacks out. And now the vicious attack, it almost goes into overdrive because now Franz pulls out his knife and repeatedly starts stabbing Alison in the stomach and her private area. And I think that this is very, significant because it's very clear that both Franz and Tians, they hate women. And Franz just keeps repeatedly stabbing Alison in the stomach and the private area over and over and over again until he has stabbed Alison a total number of 35 times. Let that sink in. Oh my god, that is such a frenzied attack. Like I said, it's clear that he hates women because of the area that he is stabbing. And to stab someone a total number of 35 times would take so much effort. But Franz, he doesn't slow down. It's almost like he gets faster and more frenzied as this attack goes on. Now in this moment, Franz and Tians, they realize that Alison is still alive. They thought that she was going to be dead from the attack on her stomach. So then Franz takes the knife and he proceeds to slit Alison's throat. But he didn't just do this once. No, he didn't just do it twice. He actually slits Alison's throat 16 times from ear to ear until she had a gaping wound in her neck. However, at the time, what Franz didn't realize is that when he was slitting her throat, he actually slit through Alison's windpipe. Now, if you remember when he was strangling Alison, he had crushed her windpipe completely, making it so Alison couldn't breathe. But now he has slit through the windpipe, creating a hole in the windpipe, which now allowed Alison to breathe again so Franz didn't realize at the time, but he has now just given her a fighting chance of survival. And following this, Alison actually regains consciousness, but everything is blurry. She doesn't have a clue what is going on. And she wakes up in the middle of that attack on her throat. So she doesn't realize what is going on, but she can kind of sense a hand or something moving back and forth across her neck. And then Franz had finished his attack on her throat. Franz and Tians again start debating is she dead? Do we think she's dead? She can't possibly survive that. So Alison, hearing them having this conversation, Alison plays dead. She stays as still as she possibly can. And eventually Franz and Tians decide that there is no way that Alison can survive the wounds that she has, even if she is still alive. She will die soon enough. So let's just leave her. 
So they get back into Alison's car and they drive off. But before they do, they throw all of Alison's clothes out of the window. Again, this is something very significant. And they just drive off and leave Alison there alone, naked, half dead, in the middle of nowhere. So Alison is lying on the ground and she is barely clinging to life. I mean, she has been stabbed 35 times in the stomach and her throat has been slit 16 times. It is a miracle that she's actually still alive at this moment. And she starts thinking to herself, what am I supposed to do? I'm in the middle of nowhere. She's not even close to the main road. How is she supposed to get out of this? So she assesses the situation and the first thing that she hears is this horrible like rasp be gurgling noise and she thinks what the hell is that noise it's horrible and she realizes that this noise is coming from her throat so she reaches up with one hand to see what is going on and her hand it just goes through her neck because there is such a gaping hole a huge gaping wound in her neck so all she feels is like wetness because there's so much blood everywhere and her hand just goes through her neck and that is just so hard for me to even imagine like your hand just going through your neck like that and that horrible like gurgling raspy noise was actually her breathing through her torn windpipe and it was in that moment that Alison realized that she couldn't control her breathing again something that I just can't even wrap my head around and Alison was just lying on the ground and she was fully convinced that she was going to die she could barely breathe and there was a gaping huge hole wound in her neck but then she had a very sad selfless thought and she thought to herself I do not want to let these two men get away with what they've done to me but I also don't want them to do this to anyone else she wanted to help the police who would find her body she wanted to help them identify her attackers so in the sand she starts to write the first names of her attackers Franz and Tians and she uses all of her strength to write these names because she thinks that it's the last thing that she can do and I actually don't know how she was even conscious enough and she had such clarity of mind to even do this. So she writes Franz and Tians in the sand next to her but then she also gathers the strength to write I love mom because she wanted her mom to know that she was thinking of her in her last moments and that she wanted to tell her mom for the last time that she loves her and then Alison just lay there basically waiting for death to come but it didn't come she was still alive and she didn't know how and this is when she thought to herself can I survive this I've made it this far can I survive just a little bit longer she thought to herself I don't want to let these two men take away my life. I want to see my friends and family again. I want to survive. So Alison knows that she needs to gather all the strength that she has left to get herself to the main road. And I really don't know how she had the strength to do this, but she manages to pull herself up to her hands and her knees. But as she did this, she felt something wet by her legs. She looked down and this is when she realized that her intestines were hanging outside of her body. Body, and they were just hanging down by her legs. Franz had stabbed her so many times that her bowels were outside of her body. Again, I asked myself, how is she surviving this? And again, I am just so amazed by Alison's strength in this moment and how she is so quick to think on her feet. She thinks, okay, how am I going to deal with this situation? And she looks around and she sees that her clothes are on the floor. Because remember, Franz threw her clothes out of the car. So she grabbed her shirt and she uses the shirt to bundle up her intestines and almost use it as a sling to hold her intestines inside of her body. This case is unbelievable. This is what I meant when I said in the beginning, I had to keep reminding myself that this was real. How does Alison have such clarity of mind to use her shirt to bundle up her intestines to put them inside of her body? I, I just, I am mind blown by this. But it gets even worse and just more unbelievable because now that Alison has her intestines kind of inside her body. She's on her hands and knees, but she needs to stand up. Again, I don't know how she had the strength to even stand up. But as Alison stood up, everything went black. 
and she was really confused. She was like, what the hell is going on? Why can't I see? Why is everything black? She said that it was the most surreal feeling that she's ever felt. So she reaches one hand up, the other hand that is not holding her intestines in. She reaches up her other hand to feel what is going on. And she reached her hand towards the gaping wound in her neck, but she couldn't feel anything. It was like her neck had disappeared and she felt around a little bit more. And this is when she realized that her head was literally hanging off backwards. She had been half decapitated. Her head was unable to stay up straight. It was just flopped backwards. Again, this is something else where I just cannot even imagine. I'm like, what the hell? This sounds like a horror film, but it's not. It is real. But it's crazy that her head was just flopped backwards. That is how much damage Franz had done by slitting her throat 16 times. And oh my God, that has to be one of the worst things I have ever heard of in these cases. I cannot even imagine her intestines are out of her body and her head is literally, and I'm not being dramatic there, it is literally hanging off. And Alison, again, I don't know how she had the strength to do this. I know I sound like a broken record, but oh my God, with her other hand, she just kind of puts her head back in place and she just has to hold her head there so she can see, so it's upright. So with one hand, she is literally holding her head in place and then the other hand is holding her intestines in. And now Alison makes the long walk to the main road and she is understandably walking very slowly. And this walk, it would have felt like the longest walk she has ever done in her life. And she was so lucky because on this evening, there was a full moon. And this full moon, it was huge and it was bright and there was no clouds in the sky. And it almost lit her path to the main road. And Alison eventually makes it to the main road. But this has taken so much effort out of her that she literally just collapses in the middle of the road. But she thinks to herself, at least I'm on the main road. At least I'm in the best possible position for someone to find me. And it wasn't too long until Alison saw headlights in the distance. A car was approaching her. Now instantly she started to panic because she was like, oh my god, what about if this is Franz and Tians coming back to finish me off? But then there was another part of her that was thinking, this is my chance. This is someone that's going to help me. So the headlights are approaching her and the driver slows down, looks at Alison. And Alison, I can't even imagine what she would have looked like, but she was was naked. She was bleeding. She is somebody that needs help. It's very obvious that she needs help. But the driver took one look at Alison and drove off. They didn't bother to get help. Nothing. They just drove off and left Alison in the middle of the road. And Alison thought that was my one chance. However, just a few minutes after that car left her, there were more headlights in the distance. And this car also slowed down to look at Alison. And thankfully, this car would not drive off. And finally, this person in the car, they were going to get out of their car and they were going to try and save Alison. So the car that pulled over was actually full of a group of students from Johannesburg and they were on holiday in Port Elizabeth. And one of the students in this car was 20 year old Tian, who was a veterinary student, which is a very similar name to Tian's, which is obviously the evil perpetrator in today's case. So Tian, saw Alison lying in the middle of the road. She was naked, she was bleeding, there was blood everywhere. And because he was a veterinary student, he knew a little bit more than maybe the average person. He ran over to Alison, he checked for a pulse and there was a faint pulse. He checked her eyes and they were incredibly bloodshot, but she was still awake, she was still conscious, she was still able to focus on him, which was a good sign. He examined her injuries and oh my God, I don't think any one could prepare you for the injuries that Alison had. There was just a big gaping wound in her neck. Like I cannot even stress the fact that it was basically like her neck wasn't there. And then her intestines were obviously hanging outside of her body. Tian immediately ripped off his shirt and he ripped it apart and started to apply it to the wounds to apply pressure. His other friends in the car, he was telling them to get out and help him apply pressure to the wounds. One of his other friends had a mobile phone. So they were able to call an ambulance and this is really significant as well because this is 1994. Not many people have a mobile phone in 1994. And this next bit, I'm not gonna lie, I don't really understand it because I am not a medical student and I don't really understand anything about the body. But he saw that her thyroid was 
out of her neck or something like that. Like he saw that her thyroid wasn't in the right place. So he was able to put the thyroid like back in her neck. Again, I'm just like, what the hell? He knew that because he was a veterinary student. And I just keep thinking, oh my God, there could not have been a better person to find Alison. And Tian knew that he had to keep Alison awake. He had to keep her conscious. Now the thing is, she couldn't talk, understandably so. So he came up with this system where Alison would squeeze his hand to answer him. And he kept asking her questions. And he was just talking to her constantly to try and keep her conscious. He kept saying that she has the most beautiful green eyes he has ever seen. So she needs to keep them open and she needs to keep looking at him. And honestly, Tian is a hero in this story. He really is because Alison, she is fighting so hard to stay conscious, but all she wants to do is go to sleep. But Tian was not about to give up on her. No, no. So they are currently waiting for the ambulance. Now the ambulance should have only really taken about 15 minutes, but 20 minutes go by and then 40 minutes go by and the ambulance still hasn't arrived. And Tian was getting incredibly stressed and anxious about where the hell this ambulance was. Tian kept thinking that at any moment he was going to lose Alison. At this point, loads of cars had pulled up around them and there was a huge crowd gathering. But Tian remained focused. He had to keep Alison awake. He had to keep her communicating through the hand squeezes. And then an hour passes and then an hour and a half passes and the ambulance still hasn't arrived. Alison's pulse was now incredibly weak. Again, Tian was saying, you have the prettiest eyes, keep your eyes open, look at me. And Alison at this point even managed to flash Tian a smile. And then after two hours, Alison is literally losing the will to fight anymore. The ambulance finally shows up. Tian helped the paramedics get Addison into the ambulance and Tian told them that he was not leaving her. He was staying by her side. So Addison was rushed to the hospital and it really was a miracle that she was even still alive and she was taken straight away into an operating theatre. And the surgeons operating on Allison were absolutely shocked by her injuries. They had never in their life seen anything as bad as this. She was absolutely filthy. She was covered in sand and black dirt. Her eyes were blood red. Her fingernails were black. Her feet and her knees were completely cut off and they were not even the worst of her injuries. Her throat had been cut from ear to ear and her wound on her neck was so deep that the doctors could see the top of her spine. Her thyroid had been cut and it said that if Tian didn't do what he did with the thyroid, she would have lost her life. Addison could have also drowned in her own blood, but she didn't. I know I've said this a million times already, but it truly is a miracle that she is still alive. And then we get to the injuries on her stomach. Her intestines had been punctured in several places. There was also dirt and debris all over them. And in order for Alison to survive, every tiny bit of sand and dirt would have to be removed and cleaned from her intestines and every single tear would have to be sewn up. There was a risk that Alison could die of sepsis if they didn't remove all of the dirt and the sand from her intestines. If they left one grain on her intestines, that could be it for Alison. There was also a risk for her throat that if they didn't do something quick, her throat could become so swollen that it would choke her. But somehow, even though the situation situation was dire for Alison. She'd also had some incredible good fortune. Every single slash wound to her throat had missed all of her major arteries, which would have resulted in instant death. The 35 stab wounds to her stomach had also missed all of her vital organs. Again, this would have killed her instantly. It is crazy how there are so many different things that if it just went slightly wrong, it could kill Alison. And remember that Alison emptied her bowels and remember I said that it was very significant, so remember it. So basically, if Alison hadn't pooped herself and she hadn't emptied her bowels, she would more than likely be dead. Because it turns out that if her intestines were any more full, they would have exploded and this would have killed her. And another 
another amazing stroke of fortune is that the on-call surgeon for the night that Alison was rushed into hospital just so happened to be a throat specialist. Again, I cannot believe how many things came together to save Alison's life. It really is a miracle. Everything just aligned for Alison. Like literally the universe was rooting for Alison. So the doctors that were operating on Alison, they knew that it was pretty much a miracle that she had even made it to their operating table, which gave them extra incentive to save her because they were like, no way has this woman gotten this far. She is not about to lose now. So they worked through the night. They worked into the next morning and they meticulously addressed every single one of Alison's wounds. They were operating on her for hours. But finally, and I'm really happy that I can say this, but Alison survived. After surgery, she went into the ICU for a few hours where she was monitored, but then Alison woke up. I can't believe it. What she went through, her injuries, how bad they were. How did she survive? The fact that she was left for dead, the fact that she had her intestines hanging outside of her body, that she had to hold her head on her body, walk to the main road, eventually get found by someone. Then she had to wait for two hours for the ambulance to arrive. Then she had to go through the extensive surgery. This story is unreal. Everything that Tian did, everything that the doctors did, everything that Alison did, it truly is the best ending to the worst story I've ever heard. So Alison is recovering in hospital and she's doing well considering. And Tian, he had worked so hard to keep Alison alive. He was still at the hospital. And when Alison saw Tian for the first time after she woke up, she burst out crying. She was so overcome with emotion. She called Tian her knight in shining armor. And what they both went through that night bonded them for life. And they actually would remain friends from this. They would have the most unique, strongest bond ever. And Tian actually comes back up at the end of this story in a very, very sweet way. So now Alison is recovering in hospital. There is one more thing that she needs to do, and that is talk to the police. But the problem is she can't speak right now. She has a tube down her neck that is delivering oxygen to her lungs and it can't be taken out. Not right now. It's needed there for recovery. So Alison wrote down the names of her attackers. She wrote down a full account of what happened and they thought that that was going to be good enough. However, it wasn't. The police said that it was more reliable if Alison verbally said the names of her attackers. And I'm just like, I get it. Okay. You want someone to say the the names of their attackers, but Alison can't bloody speak. Let her recover. She's written the names down. And these are two names that you already know of because they have been arrested before for rape. But they were like, we need you to say the names. We need you to actually say them. But taking out this tube from Alison's throat could have killed her. However, Alison, she wanted her attackers arrested. She wanted them off the street so they couldn't do this to anyone else. So they could pay for what they have done to her. So Alison instructed the doctors to take out the tube. So the doctors took out the tube and Alison looked directly at the police officers and said, my attackers were Franz and Tians. She only knew their first names, but that was enough for the police. They already suspected that it was these two men anyway, because they were both out on bail for rape. And following this, the police were able to track down Franz and Tians. It wasn't hard to find them. And they were arrested immediately. So they were brought in for questioning and Franz and Tians had no idea what they had been brought into the police station for. Because one, they were convinced that Alison was dead. And they also thought that there was no way that they could have found Alison yet. But when the detective told both of them that they were being questioned about rape and attempted murder, both of them were like, attempted murder. And the detective is just like, yeah, Alison, you didn't kill her. She's alive and she has told us everything. And they were both astounded. They really were. I would have loved to have seen their faces. So once Franz and Tians realized that because Alison was alive and she had told them everything, there was no point hiding anything. And they both gave a full confession. And they were both charged with rape and attempted murder. And they were both thankfully held in jail awaiting trial. So following this, everyone was awaiting trial. And then on New Year's Eve, 
leave 1994, just 13 days after this attack, Alison was discharged from hospital. Now, that doesn't mean that she's completely recovered, smooth sailing or anything like that. She would have a long road of recovery ahead of her. She was left with terrible wounds and scars, not just physical scars, emotional, psychological scars. Her neck had to be completely stitched up. So did her stomach. There are pictures of her wounds, obviously, after they have been stitched up, and it's absolutely harrowing. Addison needed a lot of care, and she actually moved back in with her mom so her mom could take care of her. And her mom was absolutely incredible. She is another reason why Alison was able to recover. Her mom was emotionally there for her, but also physically, because she literally had to look after Alison. She had to bathe her every day. She had to dress her wounds. She had to literally wait on Alison hand and foot. But Alison's mom did it to get her daughter back to full health. And it was during this time that the story broke in the media in South Africa. Now, so many people were touched by Alison's story. The public were absolutely horrified that this had happened to Alison, but there was a huge public support for Alison because Alison spoke up. Again, you have to remember this is 1994. Sex crimes, violent crimes against women were not taken seriously. And I have read, especially in South Africa, women didn't speak up about rape. They didn't speak up about violence. But Alison was never ashamed of what had happened to her. She wanted to speak out. She wanted to encourage other women who had experienced a similar thing to come forward, to know that they are not alone. And Alison received so much love and cards and flowers. However, before the trial, there was one more trial traumatizing thing that Alison had to do and that was she had to attend an identity parade. So Alison stood behind one-way glass and she had to identify Franz and Tians. And something that I could not believe is that in the case of Alison, this is the first time in South Africa that one-way glass was used to identify perpetrators in a case. Prior to this case, victims had to be in the same room as their attendees attackers and identify them by tapping them on the shoulder. But anyway, Alison, she was the first person, the first victim to stand behind one way glass and she identified Franz de Toy and Tians Kruger. And Alison has said that even though she was behind that one-way glass, it was one of the worst things she had ever done in her life because it took her right back to the attack. So then we get to the 12th of June, 1995, six months after the attack, and the trial finally starts. And Alison, she didn't have to, but she turned up every single day and she wanted to look at her attackers. And when it came to Franz and Tians, they are just pure evil. They really, really are. Franz actually took the stand during the trial. He showed no emotion, no remorse. He actually recounted the attack and the rape so calmly and so casually like he's talking about the weather. It's crazy how his mind works. Like I said, he almost thinks that what he has done is nothing. Why would anyone have a problem by being sexually assaulted by Franz? Because he is just irresistible to women. And remember, you probably forgotten because it's very easy to forget, but Franz is married and they have a son together. Well, his wife stood by him the whole time. I, I don't judge the wife for standing by him. I mean, mm, I do slightly, but I also am very mindful of the fact that she is possibly also a victim of Franz. But when Franz was on the stand, he tried to blame everything on the demons inside of him. He definitely has some demons inside of him. But he tried to say that he was possessed by the devil and that he wasn't to blame. You're a bad person. You have evil inside of you. We can all agree with that, but that doesn't make you not guilty. He really thought that the judge was going to let him off because he was so-called possessed by demons. And when it came to Tian's, he didn't take the stand, but he also showed no emotion, no remorse. And in the end, Franz and Tian's were found guilty on all charges. And Franz was sentenced to three life sentences and Tian's was sentenced to one life sentence. And the judge made an exception for this case because the crime was so violent and so sadistic. The judge actually put a note on both of their cases. Neither one of them should ever be released from prison. They were simply too dangerous. They would always pose a threat to the public. So they were given no 
parole. And I am really emphasizing this because this comes back up in a moment. So the trial is over. Franz and Tians are in prison and now Alison has to try and rebuild her life. And it was a very long road. There were a lot of bumps. She fell into a deep depression. She didn't go back to work. Nothing in her life felt the same as it did before the attack. However, one evening, a few months after the trial, Alison was still in a deep depression. She went to a friend's party party and when she was there she met a man. Alison started dating this man. She fell in love and two years later she got married to this man and she was just so so happy. However, sadly, after all of the surgeries that she had gone through, doctors told Alison that it was unlikely that she would ever be able to get pregnant and carry her own children full term. But then there is another miracle in this case, because a few years after getting married, Alison fell pregnant and she was able to carry her child full term. She had a very healthy pregnancy and she had a completely healthy child. And I am so, so happy for her about that. And then remember that I said Tian, the hero in this story, would come back up. Well, remember that he was a veterinary student. Well, after the whole thing with Alison, he didn't want to be a vet anymore. He wanted to be a doctor. What happened with Alison changed him completely and he knew that that is what he was supposed to do. So around 10 years after the harrowing night that Alison got attacked, Alison fell pregnant for the second time. Again, she had a completely healthy pregnancy. She carried her child full term. And then when she gave birth, Tian was one of the doctors that helped deliver her baby. How full circle is that? That is just absolutely incredible. Following the birth of her two children, Alison would go on to separate from her husband. However, they remain on very good terms. And following this, Alison dedicated her life to being the best mom that she could to her two children. But then she also has dedicated her life to helping victims of violent and sex crimes. And she has become a motivational speaker. <laughs> In the middle of difficulty lies opportunity. Well, I am going to share with you about what happened to me. But more importantly for me, I'm also here to share with you how I overcame this difficulty. Alison has turned her trauma into positivity. She would actually travel to more than 30 countries sharing her story. And she has helped countless survivors of all kinds of crime, including those involved in the 9-11 attacks. And finally, we need to get back to Franz and Tians. Ugh. I really wish we didn't have to talk about these two at the end of this video, but unfortunately there has been an update. Following the attack, they have both shown no remorse, no emotion, they have never apologized, nothing. Franz was actually allowed to get a Facebook account. You're in prison, why are we allowing prisoners to get Facebook accounts? And on his Facebook account, he would actually start multiple relationships with women overseas. But not just that. In 2016, Alison produced a documentary film about her story, which is on Amazon Prime. Highly recommend it. You should go check it out. It's called Alison, just Alison on Amazon Prime. Go watch it. And when the documentary was made, Franz himself requested to be a part of the documentary. However, he had a few demands. Number one, Alison had to write a full letter of forgiveness signed by Alison. Demand number two, he would get a share of the proceeds of the documentary. And demand number three, and I really, really cannot believe this one. This one makes my blood boil. Franz also demanded a share of the profits of the sales from Alison's book and also from her motivational speaking, backdated to her attack. Because Franz said, quote, if it wasn't for him attacking Alison, then she would never have had her success story to sell in the first place. Whew, deep breath, deep breath, deep breath. I am just like, wow, 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 wow. The audacity. Is he being serious? And he was. He was being deadly serious. Now, Alison refused his demands. She didn't want him to be a part of her documentary anyway, so goodbye, friends. But then we get to July of 2023. You are never going to believe what I am about to say, but Franz and Tians were both 
released from prison. Less than 30 years after they were first sentenced, after they were told that they would never get out, that they would never get parole, they have both now been released. So apparently in South Africa, there was a law change that every prisoner that was sentenced to life in prison deserves the possibility of parole. So there we have it. There was a law changed and now Franz and Tians are out on the streets in their 50s still capable of committing crime. It's not like they're 80 or 90. And as you can imagine, Alison is absolutely devastated and terrified that they have been released. Alison only found out the day before they were going to be released as well, which I think is absolutely disgusting. And I feel so sorry for Alison because she should not have to be scared of these two. She should not have to be worried. And when I found out that they were released, it made me think of the case of Mary Vincent, which I covered last year. And it's actually a very similar story to the case of Alison Botha. Well, the case of Mary Vincent, she was also abducted and attacked, violently raped and almost murdered by Lawrence Singleton. Lawrence Singleton, he went to prison for what he did, but then he was released from prison in his 60s and then he went on to murder somebody else. So there is clear proof that perpetrators like Franz, like Tians, like Lawrence, they can be released from prison and attack again. And I just really hope that in the case of Franz and Tians, they don't go on to hurt anybody else. But I do want to end this video focusing back on Alison because she is the main focus of today's case. And I am so happy that she was able to survive this attack. And I am so happy to bring you a survivor story because we need these every now and again. She is an incredible survivor. She is a fighter. And thankfully to this day, she is still living the best life that she can. She is still raising her two sons who are the most important people in the world to her. And she still goes on to motivate and inspire countless people all around the world. And one thing that I can't get over when it comes to today's case is how many things came together and perfectly aligned themselves to keep Alison alive. If any one of these things didn't happen, Alison probably would have died. The fact that she emptied her bowels during the attack, the fact that the stab wounds on her neck and on her stomach, they missed her main arteries and her vital organs. The fact that Franz threw her clothes out of the car, which allowed her to make a sling to keep her intestines in. The fact that there was a full moon that literally lit her way to the main road. And then what are the chances that a veterinary student was the one to stop and help her that had the basic knowledge of the human body that knew to put the thyroid like back in her throat, that his friend just so happened to have a mobile phone, that the on-call surgeon was a throat specialist. And I'm sure there are other things that I have forgotten because there truly is so many things that came together to keep Alison alive. The universe truly was working to keep Alison alive. And this case is horrific, heartbreaking, but it also is happy at the same time, if that makes sense. And Alison is an inspiration to so many. And I just wish her all the best in this world because she deserves it. And that brings us to the end of today's case. As always, let me know your thoughts, theories, and opinions. And don't forget to let me know your case suggestions in the comments down below, because I always want to know what you want to hear next. Thank you again to ExpressVPN for sponsoring today's video. And I'll see you all in my next video. Bye.